So friends, now uh, we talk about cooperation and conflict. Again, an introduction. We will take a more of these things later. And this is, uh, in a way, the last lecture in the series of discussion of individual and society. After that, we will take up concrete topics like family, religion, social stratification, and so on. In a way, this lecture is redundant. redundant as a student of engineering, you always want to introduce some redundancy in the system. So this, this discussion is redundant in the sense that this is uh, meant only for clarifying the subject matter of sociology more uh, and especially with regard to theories of society. Society has individuals, society has groups, society itself is a group and society is part of what society. I was telling you that maybe at one time world was not seen as a society, but today we will see world as a society and that's why uh, often times people talk about global village. Village is a community, how can globe be a village, a community? Yes, increasingly globe has not become a community, but globe is in the process of becoming a community. The, the day you start identifying with the global village, in the same sense in which you identify or people identified with their village community 500 years ago, the world will become a global village. It does not become global village only just because uh, some intellectuals, professors, businessmen, executives, politicians move from one country to another world will become a global society and a global village when you will start identifying with the interest of the whole globe or the whole community of mankind, community of mankind. You, you see all men and women of the world as your brothers and sisters. Okay. As in village you see other men and women as your brothers and sisters. A time may come when uh, and several people have been trying in this direction. In our country, uh, some political leaders like uh, Lohia, Ramano or Lohia, uh, they were trying to champion the cause of world citizenship, international order, peaceful order. Toward the end of his life, he's, he kept on talking you know, uh, more about the internationalism than taking up national issues. So the moment, uh, people start identifying with the world and the world becomes liberal in economic sense. There is a free flow or free mobility of people and capital from one country to another. The moment people of one country interact frequently with people belonging to other countries, more people to people interaction. Poets going to other countries, artists going to other countries, intellectuals, professors, Execu business executives, artisans, uh, going from one country to another country, interacting with people. The moment interaction between people of different world increases, the world will become a global community. Also, more our behavior is regulated by uh, norms, institutions, norms, folk ways, taboos, uh, most created in the context of internationalism. For everyone, for humans, the moment we start talking uh, of uh, norms in favor of the whole human society, we are moving towards the concept of world society. And uh, there are indicators, there are indications and indicators that we are moving in that direction. Every country is talking about millennium development goals, that by 2000, this infant mortality in our country should be halved by year this, uh, and years are specified. Degree by which uh, indicators must change is also identified. Different countries are at different levels of poverty, infant mortality, maternal mortality, literacy or illiteracy, employment, malnutrition, anemia. But Millennium Development Goals gives us a framework 
in which we can see that in our country by this year, next 5 years, next 10 years, next 20 years, these indicators must change by this much amount. So, if there are uh, rules like this, which the whole world follows, then the world has become a community. Then United Nations, Security Council, UNICEF, international organizations like Population Council, Horizon, charity organizations, religious organizations working worldwide, uh, and uh, uh, even uh, terrorism, the spread of terrorism to entire world. When terrorism is spreads to entire, if terrorism is confined only to one or two countries, it doesn't help in making the world a community. But the terrorism, the moment terrorism is spreads to the entire world, then it becomes a common problem of all the people of the world. And so, all the people of the world will have to respond in a definite manner to face the challenge of terrorism. That will also unify the world community. So, the moment we have more interaction, identity, rules and regulations, norms, folkways, mores, uh, uh, no, no matter in which country you go, you find that uh, the quality of pizza in Domino pizza is same, behavior of staff is same, the uh, equipment are same or similar, uh, the inputs used are similar, and the manners and etiquettes of people sitting there and eating there are also similar. We have become a world society. So, not in all respects, but if you see the trend, direction in which we are moving, we are moving in the direction in which uh, uh, influence of village community on us, or neighborhood on us becomes less and influence of world society or world community becomes more. We are citizens of the world, so world becomes society. Now regarding uh, theories of society, although I have already mentioned them, uh, but again I will spend some time uh, and I, I will explain these now by taking different examples and uh, slightly different, I will treat this subject slightly differently. Uh, one thing I have said is that uh, human behavior is learned, that is why we talk of society. Behavior is learned, and this learning takes place in society. Human behavior is learned, and lots of examples. You read different textbooks of sociology, they give different examples of children raised in the wood or raised by bulls or raised by animals and they say, they suggest, these stories suggest that children who were, ra who were raised uh, outside human society did not develop into a uh, normal human being. In, in one book of Haralambas, I find one interesting example that uh, Akbar, Akbar was convinced that uh, if human beings are not corrupted by society, they will speak the language of God. And for Akbar, the language of God was Hebrew. Language of God is Hebrew. As for many of us in India, language of God is Sanskrit. God speak in Sanskrit. For Akbar, the language of God was Hebrew. So, he made an experiment. In the past also, uh, people used to perform experiments. Akbar made an experiment. He selected a group of children and they were raised by deaf and dumb people. So, they are, their mind is not corrupted by influences of human languages. They were not taught Urdu, they were not taught Hindi, they were not taught Arabic and Persian, they were not taught Sanskrit, no language. They were raised by deaf and dumb people. And the experiment showed that these people, uh, they neither spoke the language of God nor any other language. So, this example is also given to suggest that human behavior is learned. And what we learn? We learn in a social setting, uh, in family, among peers, in schools. Uh, and this, this learning uh, means that uh, the older members of society pass on their learning to new members of society. So, this passing on, passing on uh, of learning, in short learning, from 
वन जनरेशन टू अनदर जनरेशन This is what uh, maintains society. This is what maintains culture, learning. Everything, all our behavior is learned, and learning uh, is passed on from one generation to another. It is in this sense we we say that India is the oldest civilization. Membership has been completely replenished. You do not know uh, uh, the greatest. a uh, historical research cannot tell us who lived in india in this part of the country for 500 years ago we don't know uh, but we know that in many respects values belief social organization attitudes of those people who inhabited this part of india 5 500 years ago were very similar to values beliefs Uh, and ideas and behavior of those who are living in this part of the country today there is similarity it is in, in this sense that we say that indian civilization is 5000 years old so there is passing on of learning learning um, um, includes many things now this culture uh, to understand this culture further the culture can be divided into two parts there is a material culture and there is a non material culture i am only using different words but i am not saying anything new i have already said all these non material culture in uh, non material culture again you can make two divisions cognitive in psychology the term cognitive means mental uh, and another part is normative these are the things which we learn cognitive means knowledge knowledge information mental aspect all mental aspects and normative means rules and values okay this is what culture means culture has two aspects material culture and non material culture non material culture can be further divided into two parts cognitive mental brain and a social normative you know that something very simple you know knowledge you know that the name of wife of ram was sita tulsidas also knew this same knowledge for hundreds of years same knowledge balmiki also knew this now you can say for thousands of years the same knowledge how do we know what balmiki knew how do we know what tulsidas knew because this knowledge has been passed to us from our previous generation from generation to generation we pass the knowledge information some people uh, take some religious information to be as true as scientific information you know, for for many believers in india the belief that if you uh, keep fast on monday then lord shiva will be happy and all desires of yours will be fulfilled is as scientific a truth as the motions of equation equations of motion as for scientists equations of three equations of motion are scientifically correct for you they are scientific scientific you have a strong belief that they are correct you cannot prove them wrong you cannot prove v equal to u plus a t wrong 
for many people in India who are religious kind, it's a scientific fact that if you keep fast on Monday and pray to Lord Shiva, then Lord Shiva will be happy and all your desires will be fulfilled. This is for them a scientific law. Or if, uh, or some people uh, may go to Panditji, astrologers and uh, consult palmists or numerologists. Or some priests may tell them that uh, actually if you pray Hanumanji, then all your problems will go. Keep fast on Tuesday and don't eat salt. And they know, many people know this. Many people know that if you go to uh, Shirdi ka Sai Baba, or if you go to Tirupati temple, have darshanam of Tirupati ka temple. I had a friend, and these, these beliefs are not confined to poor or illiterate people. Uh, the community of IIT, IIT Kanpur also believes in those things. I had a Muslim friend, uh, who believe that if he goes to Ajmer and offers a chadar on the dargah of Ajmer Sharif, he will get a son. And he went there and he actually got a son. He was very happy. His belief was further strengthened. So in several cases, actually when you have such religious beliefs, your desires are either fulfilled or they are not fulfilled. Religion, how does religion perpetuate? If your desire is fulfilled, then your belief is strengthened. It becomes more scientific. Then you believe that by going to Dargah of Ajmer Sharif, you will get a son. And you get a son, your uh, belief is further stranded. It becomes more scientific. So information is passed on from generation to generation. Sir, sir there are many Hindu people who actually don't know about Muslim religion, but they still go to Ajmer Sharif and they do the same thing. What are their beliefs? Like, uh, yes, because in India, for historical reasons, uh, we have a society in which people belonging to almost all world religions have lived together for hundreds of years. And we have learned things from each other. So, uh, today you find that in, in the country, uh, among commoners, there is much more inter-religious mixing. And there is much more inter-religious exchange of thoughts. And there are also inter-religious faiths. Uh, for, for example, you can't say that Sufism belongs to Islam only. Today, Sufi songs are liked by everyone. Sufi beliefs, many Sufi beliefs are beliefs to which everyone subscribes. If you go to Ajmer Sharif, you find that not only Muslims, but also Hindus go there. I have gone to Ajmer Sharif. Uh, and uh, uh, there, are, there are many, uh, Hind, uh, when I was a child, I remember that whenever I fell sick, uh, my mother would take me to a local graveyard of uh, Shia sects of Muslims, where uh, Muharrams are buried. And she believed that if, I, if we go to uh, that graveyard uh, of some Muslims, uh, if we go to that graveyard and we offer some sweet, uh, the local variety of sweet was batasa, a local sweet. And we offer, if we offer batasa and we pray there, then our desires will be fulfilled. So we were Hindus, but my mother uh, took me to the uh, to, uh, there are in many districts um, of UP, same thing must be true for other parts of the country also. There are some famous dargahs of Sufi saints where both Muslims and Hindus go and they have the common belief systems. Similarly, there are many Muslims uh, who celebrate, actually Muslims should celebrate all Hindu festivals. 80% or more of Muslims are converts from Hindus only. So it's only in the process of Islamization after conversion that they start thinking that uh, their ancestors came from Persia or Arab. But actually, 80% uh, or more Muslims. This is written by Muslim scholars themselves, that uh, Muslims are only converts from Hindus. So their ancestors were Hindus only. And there are many Muslims who participate in celebration of Deepavali and Holi. There are many Sikhs who go to Vaishno Devi temple. And there are almost all Hindus in Punjab and Haryana who, who visit Gurdwaras. So if we did not have 
a corrupt political system, perhaps our society would be, our civil society would be much more mature and much more secular and plural and much more intermixing type. If today we have some kind of hatred developing among different types of communities, I would say that is more for political reasons. Otherwise, at one time, we had much more intermixing of religious and other community. This is true. Perhaps uh, in some seasons, more Hindus go to Ajmer Sharif than Muslim. And other dargahs also. Uh, when I, uh, I go to uh, visit a relative of mine in Sahibabad, uh, I get down at Ghaziabad and take a, an auto or something. Uh, I was told that in between there is a dargah. Uh, I'm forgetting name of that Sufi saint. And uh, their people believe that uh, their desires are fulfilled. All there is a large congregation of people, mostly Hindus. My brother, uh, I have a brother-in-law who runs a business in Kenya. And every year he comes to India to visit the dargah of Ghaziabad only, a Muslim saint's dargah. He believes, so uh, in India we are secular, plural society. And because of intermix, because of the fact that we have interacted, you know, sociological term interaction, because Hindus and Muslims and Christians and Sikhs and all interacted together for a long time uh, and cooperated with each other for a long time, fought with each other for a la long time, and we have the experience, good and bad, of both cooperation and conflicts. So, civil society of India is quite secular and intermixed. The problems are being created more uh, by the political class. So there is a cognitive part, information, mental, uh, and there is a normative part. Rules means norms, norms and values. There are two parts of uh, the non-material culture. And this also means that if you go to a different culture, uh, I broke this, uh, I, I brought something to show it to you. Uh, uh, there is a small, uh, bulb kind of thing with some holes on that. This is made by earth in villages of Africa. Uh, I had brought this to show. Uh, I wanted to show that none of you will recognize that because you have not seen that ever. Now that, uh, that earthen flute-like globe is part of African culture. And uh, that is part of material culture of Africa that that also interacts with these things. So, uh, uh, there is a knowledge, uh, there is a knowledge part, there is a belief part. So, behind everything, if I take this thing and go to uh, a remote tribal area of Northeast, where people have never seen this, what will, what will they think of this? Uh, we recognize things because they are part of our culture, objects, material, artifacts, uh, manufactures, uh, they are part of material culture and that interacts with this and this on the basis of certain knowledge that is produced and that is supposed to be used for certain purposes. And certain purposes and certain type of knowledge, technology, knowledge leads to production of certain things. That is everything is part of culture. So, culture can be, uh, I, at this stage I remember that uh, uh, one anthropologist said that uh, uh, this uh, non-material culture and uh, this, uh, the fact that human behavior is learned and information is passed on from one generation to another does not mean that culture does not change, culture also changes. And different aspects of culture can change at different rates. One anthropologist suggested that if you look at your socio-cultural problems, then uh, you will find that the root cause of those problems is that changes in <coughs> material culture are faster than changes in non-material culture. Change, change in material culture 
is more rapid than in non material culture this and uh, he gave the concept of cultural lag for this if culture can be broadly divided into two categories material and non material it has been observed that material culture changes at a fast rate or faster rate than the rate at which non material culture changes and that is at the root of several problems of socio cultural type to give you an example of this uh as far as artifacts of modernity are concerned some examples say computer television and in television again there are so many developments uh, modern furniture modern wood other electronic gadgets air conditioned cars the uh, manufacturers part of material culture scientific culture technological culture culture of modern societies there is no objection in any part of the world there is no conflict with religious groups or caste or communities or racial groups or ethnic groups or tribal non tribal uh north america south america there is no conflict in all parts of the world or atom bomb or nuclear bomb nuclear bomb is part of material culture everyone wants nuclear bomb there is no opposition so uh, material culture can travel at a very fast rate material artifacts get accepted at a very fast rate everyone wants them modernity is associated with them but when it comes to non material culture then there are problems so you uh, from time to time you find that on issues of non material nature there are conflicts there is complete cooperation as far as the material culture is concerned no hindu no muslim no christian no sikh uh no you will oppose development of medicines to uh, to treat cancer or cardiovascular diseases or infections skin diseases tuberculosis everybody will welcome them but when it comes to new ideas ideas of humanism the civil law civil, how is civil law in hindu uh when we talk of uniform civil code in india uniform does not mean hindu actually uh, nothing means hindu hindus are so diverse uh, so different from each other and i gave the example of marriage yesterday uh, marriages between blood relatives uh, are very common in south actually they are the preferred form of marriages and marriages between blood relatives are discouraged in much of north india so what is hindu about it nothing similarly food habits in many parts of the country hindu ji even eat beef you may not know but this is a true that, uh, if you talk to a keralite a keralite hindu will not be shocked to find that hindu ji eat beef because in kerala hindus can eat beef in up uh, majority of hindus or at least those who lived sanskritized style of life would not eat non vegetarian items but brahmins brahmins are hindus brahmins of bengal brahmins of uh, hilly regions brahmins of uh, various parts of the country will eat non vegetarian items they will sacrifice goats they will eat goats they will eat uh, chicken they will eat fish again there are no there is nothing uh, uh, which 
there is no single rule i think no single book no single idea nothing can unify all hindus the only thing that they li- they are uh, they are not anything else they are hindu hindu is a residual category so if uh, in that context you talk of unique civil code it's not hindu but muslims who have no objection to material culture will have a strong objection to uniform civil code why because the non material culture does not change at that scale a time may come as we are as i said that we are moving in the direction of making society a world as a world society a community so a time may come and if mankind survives i am sure that a time will come when the whole world will believe in the same non material culture rules and these rules and values will be humanistic and only humanistic the moment you have world society you become only a citizen of the whole world you cannot remain indian or pakistani or hindu or muslim you, you have uh, the rules uh, in, and we find evidence of that increasingly we are becoming a human being we are defining ourselves as a human being we are becoming a world citizen it does not matter to us uh, we may get education at iit kanpur but that does not prevent us from working in new york or mexico or moscow or germany or paris we are becoming world citizen and the moment we become world citizen we will um, we govern our behavior will be governed more by rules and values of world citizenry we will become world citizen so what is wrong if we talk of uniform civil code in india but although um, uniform civil codes will not be codes or they are not codes they cannot be codes in which all hindus of india believe and legally speaking uh, uh, hindus include buddhist sikhs jains also so uh, but there is a muslim opposition to uniform civil code this shows how uh, non material cultures resist any kind of change the reasons are maybe again several political suspicion uh, or historical reasons or maybe religious reasons or the whole, a greater hold of religious priests on some community hold of religious priests from hindus has almost gone or uh, uh, new types of priests are emerging from all castes and communities uh, and more and more people understand that these priests are only making us fools but in case of certain religious community the hold of religious priests is still very strong and that may explain it but anyway Uh, the point is that uh, culture can be divided into two parts like this is part of material culture but what we will do this what we will do with this that is determined by this what is this and what is to be done by this how is this produced what is this this is part of material culture how is it produced in uh, factories uh, with what material how are inputs uh, raw material in obtained what science what equations what mathematics uh, what chemistry what physics is required in production of this that is part of cognitive culture and what we will do with this just because uh, it is part of material culture it has been produced the moment it has been produced it has become part of this and there is a whole science knowledge mathematics physics chemistry uh, raw material which have gone into production of this so it is very it's a reality now a material reality but what shall we do with this we can do many things with this kya kar sakte hai isse fight bhi kar sakte hai we can fight with this it can serve as a weapon it can serve as a, as an instrument of communication many things can be done what shall we do with this and how shall we use it how shall we use it that is the part of normative culture Now, in this respect, uh, I find that one distinction made by uh, uh, Gisbert between attitudes and interests is quite interesting. Uh, since I have 
already mentioned about organismic theories, evolutionary conflict. Uh, I am not spending much time on these concepts. I am only trying to elaborate how they are applied. Organismic was uh, an assumption that uh, a society is like a, a biological organism, as in biological organism, as in case of human body or animal body, you have eyes, you have stomach, you have ears, uh, you have legs, you have hands, brain, likewise in society you have several institutions. Uh, one institution is responsible for production of food item, another institution for safety and security, another institution is dealing with religious or magical or supernatural beliefs like that. So, human society is like an organism. And if it is like an organism, how does it maintain? This is how society maintains itself. This kind of conceptualization will go more with organismic theories. Evolutionary theory will deal more with how society evolves as a cell, uh, uh, as a small fetus uh, gets evolved into a complex human body. A, a simple uh, fetus in mother's womb uh, subsequently grows into a complex human body. Uh, with a complex brain, like that society also evolves from a simple, uh, the simple form must have existed in ancient times in the stage of food gathering, wandering and now we have a post industrial society, a very complex society. It has evolved and it has passed through certain definite stages. And in society we have both cooperation and conflict and the basis of cooperation and conflict can be attitudes and interests. I thought that uh, I must spend a few minutes uh, clarifying the concept of attitude and interest as given in your textbook of Gisbert. Friends, uh, one simple distinction between them, between interest and attitude. And these interests and attitudes are the basis of conflict and cooperation. Uh, are you and me in conflict or cooperation? Is there a conflict between students and teachers or a cooperation? Now, since I said that in sociology there is no right or wrong answer, I think uh, it, it all depends on the perspective. Uh, you can say that there is cooperation, you can also say that there is conflict. Um, as for interests are objective, I will tell you in what sense we are cooperating and in what sense we are in conflict. Attitudes are individual. subjective, emotional, evaluative, we evaluate. So, our attitude towards something may be favorable or unfavorable, evaluation is involved. Attitudes are sentiments, they are individual, subjective, emotional and evaluative. We are either in favor of something or we are against something. Interests are objective and that means they may be common. Uh, attitudes can be uh, like or dislike. Your attitude and my attitude towards something may be alike or it may be dislike, but attitudes cannot be common. Interests are matters of values. You see, one can say that the relationship between teachers and students is cooperative. There is a common interest. We are cooperating because there is a common interest. 
ऑब्जेक्टिव कॉमन एंड ए मैटर ऑफ वैल्यू वॉट इज दैट वैल्यू यू आर ए न्यू एंट्रेंट टू इंडियन सोसाइटी यू आर यंगर जनरेशन कल्चर मीन्स पासिंग ऑन ऑफ समथिंग फ्रॉम वन जनरेशन टू यू बिलोंग टू यंगर जनरेशन आई एल and there is a cooperation you are not working for yourself i am not working for myself all of us are working in the interest of indian society and a very specific interest that interest what is our interest interest is dissemination dissemination and generation of knowledge our interest lies interest is common there is a common interest and actually the fact that the interest is common this interest belong to society it's not your personalized attitude uh, it's an interest a value this is a value of indian society value of all societies dissemination and generation of knowledge in dissemination and generation of knowledge uh people of the previous generation and people belonging to new generation must cooperate so that the indian society survives develops grows uh becomes more powerful uh that is the interest and in that interest we are cooperating what does attitude mean attitude uh attitude is personal individual it's emotional uh it's uh, evaluative and like or uh, our wish to acquire knowledge or my wish to acquire knowledge or my wish to read the subject matter of sociology and interpret this to members of new generation of indian society my wish that wish is subjective individualized and that is a kind of attitude with that some emotional state is also attached all teachers will not have common attitude it is individual sentiments or uh, wishes or desires or dreams or evaluation <coughs> some teachers may not like teaching they may come to teaching profession for the reason that teaching profession also permits them to do research their attitude there are no common attitudes attitudes are personal one teacher similarly students attitudes of students are emotional states they have in acquiring education you think all the students are uh, like uh, all the students uh, are alike in their attitudes sentiments individualized dreams wishes uh, they they react samely towards education no for some it's an enjoyment for some it's training for some it is instrument of getting a good job for some they are only fulfilling their parents wishes for some it's a burden a uh, unavoidable burden so some is some students will study <coughs> for grades some because they have the, they have deep interest in the subject so there are all kinds of attitudes all kinds similarly um, as among teacher there are all kinds of attitudes among students also there are all kinds of attitudes attitudes can be like or dislike but they cannot be common there is no common attitude of students towards education there is no common attitude of teachers towards education this dissemination and generation of knowledge not common some for some it is a job because they did not find any other job so as, so they have come to teaching profession after all in teaching also they are drawing good salary and they have house on the campus and safe and secure place and uh, uh, we do not feel so much threatened in the sense of students of iit kanpur 
as uh, uh, an executive engineer of electricity will feel uh, Amis crowd done. It's a very good job. Teaching is a very, uh, no threat to our security. Nobody, uh, in, uh, nobody humiliates us. So some people may come because it's a good job. Yes? Like that, different people may have different attitude. How to see the relationship between teachers and students as a relationship of conflict? As there is a conflict between males and females, upper caste and lower caste, urban and rural areas, rich and poor, North India and South India, uh, one can see that the relationship of teachers and students is also of conflict. Teachers are dadas, students are on the receiving end. Teachers decide which book to be consult consulted, what to be read in the course, how many quizzes or uh, mid-sem exams or end-sem exams be given to students, how to evaluate, how many A's and B's to give, and students are on the receiving end. Students' wish is nowhere noted. Forget about fulfilling the wishes of students. It is not even recorded anywhere. You select 2,000 best students from the uh, whole country. Uh, ideally speaking, the 2,000 students who are the best students of the country after 10 plus 2 uh, must be given choice to decide for themselves what career they would like to make. Whether they would go for engineering or arts or fine arts or wrestling or painting or what they want to do in life. The be from conflict perspective, the best youths of the country should have been given the choice. They want to become film actor, or they want to become civil engineer, or they want to become poet, or what. But in this society, in which there is a big gap of power between previous generation and new generation, and in academics between teachers and students, <coughs> students have absolutely no say, and teachers will decide that if you have a J rank of this, you go to computer science. If you have J rank of this, you go to civil engineering. So it's a relationship of conflict. In conflict relationship, uh, there is a powerful group and there is a vulnerable group. The students constitute the vulnerable group. If you have this J rank, you are to be treated like Brahmins and you will go to computer science. If you have one rank less, then you go to electrical. And if your rank is this, you are like Shudraj or untouchable, then you go to civil engineering or aerospace. <laughs> Power. So the Students place, students place in society is not equal. It should have been in a society free from conflicts. The place of new generation, old generation in the interest of this should have been same. And students must, actually students must have a greater say. They are going to constitute the future generation of adults in this country. They should have had better say in deciding what they want to do. But actually, the people who are going to constitute the adults of tomorrow, they are given absolutely no say. And uh, uh, just to make the discussion slightly light, the teaching community uh, as powerful elite or uh, as gundas are exercising their power. Their teachers are dabangs and students are vulnerable. So from the perspective of conflict, there is a relationship of power. And students have even students do not even have say in deciding how they should be evaluated. Maybe some student is good at language. He can write a very good sociology assignment. Why should he be given mid-sem exam and end-sem exam? Why should he be given objective type paper? Maybe some students are not good at language. They can do better at objective type. So students should be asked. But because this society is governed by teachers, the teachers are more powerful, so students have no say. And what the teachers decide gets decided for the whole uh, population of teachers and students. So in, from that point of view, it's a relationship of conflict. Whether groups are cooperating or they are in conflict depends on what sociological perspective we apply to look at the issue. Okay? We stop here. Thanks.